Dr. Osteroff is the Deputy Commissioner for Foods and Veterinary Medicine. It's a position he assumed in May of 2016. In that role, he oversees the food and animal health activities of FDA, including FDA's responsibilities in the area of food safety and nutrition, food labeling, food and color additives, cosmetics, dietary supplements, animal drugs and animal feed, and research to support the food and veterinary medicine mission of FDA. Wow, that's a lot of stuff you're in charge of. Yeah, I don't know how you sleep. Um, so we're really fortunate to have him join us today, and he's going to go ahead and offer um, a welcome and an introduction. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Betsy. It's great to be here. Um, I don't know if you uh, sort of uh, saw things in the future, but my understanding is that Cincinnati is absolutely awash in water these days, and so maybe it was the right place to hold this meeting. Um, I'll also start by saying it's good to see somebody from central Pennsylvania in the room. I know the one gentleman said he was from Chambersburg. I actually live in Harrisburg nearby, and every weekend I go to at least one of our farmer's markets, and I like to buy locals. So it's great to see so many farmers here. And I'll also try several times during the talk to smile just for those people who are <laughs> watching remotely since I heard that one comment. So let me just start by um, thanking the folks at the Produce Safety Alliance, uh, in particular Betsy Bin and Gretchen Wall, for organizing this meeting and doing all of the hard work to put it together. I'd also like to thank Samir and the folks in the Office of Food Safety and the Division of Produce Safety for their work on the content of the program and quite frankly for all of their hard work on the content of the produce safety rule. I'd also like to thank my colleagues from the National Association of the State Directors of Agriculture, the NASDA folks who are in the room who also worked very closely with us on putting together the program. I think as evident by the really impressive turnout in the audience, and on the web, um, there are literally hundreds of folks that are watching this on the web and participating virtually all around the country, and I suspect even outside the country, as you mentioned. So clearly, there's really a great deal of interest in this particular summit. I understand the seats that are here in the, men in the venue um, in Cincinnati were a hot commodity. Somebody told me that they were grabbed up about as quickly as tickets for a Bruce Springsteen concert or a Beyonce concert, and that depends on which generation you're in. Uh, I, uh, I didn't check to see if the seats were being sold or bartered on eBay in the way that Super Bowl tickets are sold. Um, well, I didn't see any scalpers outside the meeting venue either, and so hopefully that's not the case. But I do think that the really tremendous uh, interest in this particular summit since we announced it just highlights how important all the work that we'll be doing over the next couple of days is to the farming community that falls under the produce safety rule and how important it is to all of us at FDA as well. Um, the feedback that comes out of this summit will without question help determine how we make the agricultural water standards in the produce safety rule more workable. More workable for you and more workable for us as the regulators because that's what it's all about. So some of you know that have seen me speak before that I like to use quotations in my presentations. And I do that usually because others say things far more eloquently than I happen to do. But today, instead of using a quote, I'm going to use a song lyric. And for your benefit and mine, I'm actually not going to sing it. Um, I grew up in the 60s. Yes, that means that I'm old. Um, there was a group at that time called the Hollies, um, who of course named themselves after Buddy Holly. They had a song that was called, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. Probably many in the room know that one. Um, the song starts out, um, the road is long with many a winding turn. And although they weren't thinking of the produce safety rule, they could have um, because um, they could have been talking about the process that we use to develop all of the rules under the Food Safety Modernization Act. 
Um, it indeed has been a long and winding road, which, in case you don't remember, is also the song title of a Beatles song. Uh, FISMA was signed into law in 2011, including the requirements for standards for the safe growing of produce. But the produce safety rule was only finalized five years later in early 2016 after countless public engagement sessions throughout the country, engagement sessions overseas. After issuing a proposed rule, we received thousands and thousands of comments, probably from most of you in this room, and we ended up reproposing the rule based on that feedback. We then got lots of additional comments on the reproposed rule. So there were clearly many contentious issues in the produce rule. Things like the biological soil amendments, things like the farm definition, and these are also things that we continue to work on today. But by far, the dominant issue in all of those comments and in all of those sessions was water. And there are probably many reasons for that, but I think that the underlying reason is that agricultural water is really important to you as growers, probably second only to the seeds themselves. You can't grow crops without water, and you don't grow crops in a sterile environment. We recognize that. Agricultural water, however, is also critical to produce safety. We know that from investigating far too many produce-related outbreaks over the years where water turned out to be the culprit. There is no question that to reduce the risk of contamination of produce by the water that's used on the crops, we need water standards. And no matter how you feel about the water standards we ended up with in the final rule, there should be consensus in this room about the need for the standards. So let's take that as a given. We're not here to discuss whether we need standards. We're here to discuss what they ought to be. Even though we had that long and winding road to finalize the produce safety rule, that doesn't mean we um, successfully achieved a goal of establishing a workable framework for all growers to manage the water that they use during the production of fresh produce. I recognize that pretty quickly through discussions and visits. Yes, yeah, there some way to shut it off? Yeah. Through discussions and visits with you. You told me pretty quickly when I took over this particular position in 2016 that the requirements that we established in the produce safety rule for the quality and testing of agricultural water were simply too complex and difficult to understand. They were often too costly to implement, and in some instances you told me that they were nearly impossible to implement based on the circumstances of your farm. I heard that on visits to farms in Florida, in Washington State, in Oregon, in Wisconsin, in Alabama, in California, in Delaware, and in Hawaii, just to name a few of the states that I visited over the past year and a half. And as a result of your feedback, we made it clear in early 2017 that we probably didn't get that part of the rule right. And if that's the case, we would need to do something about it by taking another look at the ag water standards. We first said this publicly in January of 2017, and I said it often throughout the course of the year. But despite those statements, we became aware of pressure from your customers that they wanted you to begin implementing the ag water standards even before the compliance date. We knew growers were seeking out laboratories that could test samples using method 1603 that was contained in the rule, and in some cases, you couldn't find a lab that would do that particular method, or it was too far away for you to be able to get your specimens there in a timely fashion. So some of you even began setting up your own laboratories and shelling out money to be able to do so even though we knew that the requirements were probably going to change. Let's see if the computer can turn itself off. 
Uh oh. That's what happens with technology. Yeah. <laughs> uh. It's great when it works and it's not when it doesn't. So anyway, in September of 2017, just to make it clear to everybody, we issued a draft rule to extend the compliance dates for the Agricultural Water Summit uh, standards by an additional two to four years. Under the proposal, the earliest compliance date will be 2022 for the largest farms. And we also said that FDA would not enforce the ag water requirements while this rulemaking was underway. We made several other announcements at this time and probably the one that got the most attention was that inspections to be able to ensure compliance with the produce safety rule would not begin until 2019 to give more time for education and technical assistance. But I hope that none of you think that just because we've proposed to delay the agricultural water standards and we'll be delaying inspections that you don't have to do anything under the produce safety rule. That just isn't the case. If you're a sprouts grower, the original compliance date or the initial compliance date for the large sprouters was January of 2017. And for other covered commodities, the compliance date for the largest farms was just a month ago for all of the provisions other than the water provisions. This reflects the flat fact that produce safety is so important to food safety. And we all want the same thing, which is a robust market in safe and healthy fruits and vegetables. And we all want the same thing for the ag water standards, and that is to establish requirements that are less burdensome while still protecting public health. So from the FDA perspective, what is it that we want to see accomplished during this summit? At the top of the list is to be able to get more information from you about on-farm conditions and your water systems. We want to hear about the challenges that you face as you address the risks to the quality of your water systems and what problems you saw in the standards in the final rule. We very much welcome feedback regarding viable alternative approaches to the quality and testing standards. And we're especially interested in unique water management approaches that we may be unaware of. We see revisiting the water standards as a collaboration with stakeholders, including all of the stakeholders in this room and stakeholders that are on the web participating virtually. And we will take all of that feedback into consideration as we move forward. When I first started talking about the ag water standards, one of the things that I mentioned that we were really seeking to change was the reliance on method 1603 and the challenges that it posed. Since then, we've identified eight other testing methods that we consider to be scientifically valid and at least equivalent to method 1603. They're all posted on our website at fda.gov. So unless there are concerns about this particular determination, I would hope that that issue has been resolved and that we don't need to talk about that over the next few days. So I would be remiss if I didn't try to manage expectations for the pathway forward. There seems to be a misconception that the pathway forward has already been set and that we know what the outcome is gonna be. That just isn't the case. All options are on the table, including reopening the rule. But there may be other options to get to the same place, including addressing the issue through guidance, or maybe some combination of both. It depends on your feedback during this summit, and it depends on these solutions to address the concern. Obviously, we were able to address the concerns with method 1603 without actually doing a rule change. We're also not looking to re-examine all of the parts of subpart E of the produce rule that covers agricultural water, but instead to, issue, to address particular issues. It's so very high on my list, and I've said this publicly for the last year, is the frequency of testing and the timing of testing, especially when establishing the baseline. Also, how we're gonna calculate that your water actually meets any standards that we eventually end up with. However, there are probably other issues that you want to bring to our attention. This is as much your meeting as ours. 
Before finishing, let me just bring to your attention a couple of other things that have been occurring related to the produce rule. We've honored our commitment to be able to partner with the states to implement the rule by developing their own uh, produce safety programs. Last year, we put out almost $31 million distributed to 43 states to develop their own programs, and 40 of those states signed up for the inspection and compliance component so that you can interact and see them on your farms rather than seeing FDA. However, in the 10 states that are not covered by the inspection component of the cooperative agreement, FDA is going to have to conduct the inspections when the time comes, working closely and communicating with our state partners. We're also expecting to very soon publish the long-awaited produce safety draft guidance sometime this spring. It'll be accompanied by user-friendly communications materials as a resource for growers that are covered by the rule. Unlike the guidances that we've already put out for the preventive controls regulations, which are coming out sequentially in different chapters, the produce safety guidance when it comes out is going to cover all of the chapters in the rule except for right now the agricultural water standards because obviously we're still working on them. One of the other efforts that we've been working on to help support farmers is something called the on-farm readiness reviews. We're working very closely with NASDA on that. It's a program that's coordinated by them. This involves a voluntary farm visit by a team of state officials, cooperative extension agents, and FDA produce experts that will be able to help assess the readiness of the farm to be able to meet the requirements of the produce safety rule. So we're on track to begin these on-farm readiness reviews sometime this spring. Training sessions are underway, and the states are working to set up the mechanisms for farms to be able to request those reviews. They'll officially begin as this summer growing season starts to advance. We're also supporting both farmers and our state partners through the Produce Safety Network, which are specially trained FDA staff that are located throughout the country. The Produce Safety Network works with other stakeholders, such as cooperative extension agents and other educators, to develop and share information to the farming community. This team can provide technical assistance, it can provide outreach, it can help with investigations, and when needed, they can conduct investigations in, or inspections in the states that don't have the cooperative agreement and also can do, can do foreign inspections. So the PSN members are actively working with the state produce program staff and they're very much interested and still in the mode of trying to best understand the local growing conditions. One of the ways that they've been doing it is to try to interact directly with as many as farmers as possible. And in 2017 alone, our produce safety network um, participants um, made more than 100, in fact, 117 educational visits to U.S. farms to be able to listen directly to farmers about the challenges they face, to, to be able to learn about the unique growing conditions in their regions, and to address any questions and concerns about various aspects of the produce safety rule. There's been great progress in training in 2018 through the PSA alone, uh, through Betsy and her group. Um, there's been almost 600 grower training sessions, both domestically as well as internationally. They've trained more than 14,000 farmers. That's a pretty big number, but we realize that there's still more work to do. They, there's also training available for the international growing community through something called the Produce International Partnership for Education. Um, and regulator training is also well underway, and we have six produce regulator training sessions that are planned in cooperation with NASDA over the course of the year. Lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize Jim Gorney, who's here in the room. Jim recently joined FDA, he's there waving in the back, this time as the Senior Advisor for Produce Safety in our Center for uh, Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. And I say this time because Jim has previously worked at FDA. He was there a number of years ago during a very critical time period when FSMA was actually enacted and during the early phases of the development of the regulation, especially the one around the produce safety rule. He then went to industry uh, where he worked at the Produce Marketing Association. 
Jim is a scientist who knows the growing community and he knows how fruits and vegetables are grown and marketed and so he's a great addition to our team. He's come back at a really pivotal time and we look forward to him working very closely to help steer the course that lies before us related to ag water. You'll also be hearing from Jim over the course of the meeting. One of the last things that I'll mention is that we are st uh, strengthening our long-standing collaboration with USDA on produce safety. Just about a few weeks ago, the Secretary, uh, Sonny Perdue, and our Commissioner, Scott Gottlieb, announced a formal agreement to, among other things, enhance our cooperation and our collaboration around produce safety. We are keenly interested in continuing our collaborations with USDA to further our work in understanding the way that food contamination occurs, as well as in helping us answer the many challenges we're currently facing on issues like agricultural water and soil amendments. Um, also under discussion with USDA is the need to further enhance the compliance of agricultural products that are imported into the United States with the new produce safety standards because one of the things that's been very important to us is that we hold produce that's grown outside of the United States to the same standards as produce that is grown within the United States. There should be no difference. The consumer expects that and we expect that to occur. So we've held preliminary discussions um, uh, about greater collaboration with USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service to provide outreach and information to foreign producers, regulators, and other relevant stakeholders. So let me just close by mentioning the last section of the lyrics to He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. This one says, it's a long, long road from which there is no return while we're on the way to there, why not share? This is a summit that marks a turning point for us. There is no return, there is no turning back. We will work and we will work with you to make the ag water standards less burdensome and more feasible to implement so that we can meet our new proposed compliance date of 2020, uh, 2022. And while to some of you that can seem like it's a long way away, in regulatory terms it really isn't, it's just around the corner. But in order to be able to meet that new date, we have to work hard and we have to hear from you. And so during this meeting, don't be shy, don't be quiet. As the song says, why not share? After all, that's what we're all here for, to talk, to listen, and to come up with workable solutions. So let me just end by thanking you for your attention, and now let's get down to the real business of the meeting. Uh, thanks all of you for being here. I know it's not easy to travel that far distance in many instances, and we really appreciate your enthusiasm and interest as we re-examine the Ag Water Standards. Thanks again. Maybe it's fresh produce. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much for those words. Um, I guess he covered a lot of stuff. Uh, the one thing that struck me was the all options are on the table. So I think that, that sets the mood. I do have to mention two things that he mentioned that I had wanted to mention in the beginning. One, that Cincinnati is underwater. It's like they saw us coming. Um, and two, I was remiss in not mentioning NASDA as well. Um, NASDA uh, really worked with us to make this agenda, including Bob, Joe, Commissioner Ball out of New York, and Jen Trodden worked on the development of the agenda. So I was very happy that Dr. Ostroff caught that because um, I had missed that. <clears throat>